This morning we will turn our attention to a subject that I sort of like very much, watching God. There are times in our lives when we are not sure we understand what God is doing. In the story of Job, for instance, we are privileged to eavesdrop on a conversation between God and Satan. But Job is clueless. So if you were in Job's shoe, you think, I didn't do anything, God. What's up with this? You know? But you and I are listening in amazement. God said, Satan said, God replies, and Satan left the presence of God, and the trouble begins. Job doesn't know, though, so he's confused. All I'm trying to do is to serve you, God, so what's going on? And we want to say, calm down, Job. God has a boast out on you. You'll be all right. Poor Job, though, is confused. After I've done good, why do I reap evil? Another account of a story in the Bible is that of Lazarus. And what is God doing? Lazarus is sick in John chapter 11. His sister is Mary and Martha, friends of the Lord. Lazarus himself is a friend of Jesus so they sent to let Jesus know. He knows the boy is sick, but he stays two more days before he comes. And at the two, Martha says, Lord, by now he stinks. And the sisters weep. And we who know the grand finale, we want to say, girls, take it easy. Jesus will raise your brother from the dead. Let me ask you a question. Which of you will worry if you knew that Jesus would raise your loved one in a day or two? You won't worry, will you? Why would you shed a tear? Also, why do we worry then about the unknown? I hate to make this confession, but one Either we don't know God, or two, our view of him is obscured. If we look at him long enough, if we gaze on his face, we will see who he is and what his plans are for us. Says author Billy, Billy Bright in his book, God is the Issue. Every problem we face can be traced to an inaccurate view of God. Do you want me to say that again? Every problem we face can be traced to an inaccurate view of God. Now, unfortunately, he says, for most of us, our view of God barely scratches the surface. The solution is to discover who God really is and why it matters. So, he says, go deeper. Maybe you, like me, I'm confessing, don't really know your God like you say you do. You see, God is love. And God's love resembles what we feel for our children, our friends, our family. But our love is barely the picture of how deep, how high, how wide God's love really is. Consider the picture of an iceberg, so large and looming a body of ice above the ocean surface. And yet, what we see is only one-tenth of the entire thing. That is observed. That is what we see. The larger portion is beneath the surface of the water. This is how I see God's love. Beneath the surface, the unseen, the misunderstood love of God is nine times bigger than that little portion you see. Or you, you really are aware of. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9, Eyes hath not seen nor ear heard. That's how I know it's nine times bigger. 
neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God had prepared for them that love him. You know a little, but consider yourself ignorant. You don't know it like you should. You cannot begin to understand God's love. God's love is so big, so wide. If we got a close enough, close enough glimpse of God, our problems will become small and insignificant. Dr. Billy Bright again, he says, he asks these questions. Why can't I forgive? Why can't I beat addiction? Why do I feel empty? Why do I feel lonely? Why do I feel jealous, disappointed, empty, unfulfilled, hopeless, stressed, angry, hateful, or even down? Could it be because... We can't see God clearly or fully or and we lack an understanding of his love. Well, I am watching God. I'm watching God and I'm inviting you to take a deep, long look at God and Jesus. He loves you like no one else can. He reaches down over the eons of times and finds a soul, this soul, your soul, you, and he loves you back to himself and to safety. Remember, we're watching God this morning. John chapter 14, verse 8 through 9. This is what it says. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. And Jesus said to Philip, he said to him, have I been with you so long, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Well, to say the least, when I invite you to watch and see who God is, to know and accept his power, you do this only as you accept Christ and his simple Ordinary, down-to-earth, loving examples, which teaches us really who God is. In a common phrase of ours, we say, like father, like son. This is when we want to say what a son does resembles what his father would do. He has the habits, he has the mannerism, K does, of his dad. Reminds me every day. I do not go a day and don't remember Cade's dad, because of Cade. And he stick his hand in his pocket the same way. <laughs> Everything about this child says dad. So if I wanted to know, and you didn't know who Cade's father was, take a little look at him. He holds his head like him. <laughs> Everything, I kid you not. <laughs> Everything like him, and you should see him in the house. Everything like him. So if you didn't know who Cade's dad was, take a close-up look at Cade. And I'll show you who he is. Let's turn our Bibles to John chapter 4, verse 1 through 27. For that is our scripture for this morning. And I will read for you from the King James Version. Follow me if you would. John chapter 4, verse 1 through 27. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, and I'm going to read pretty quickly, okay? Though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go to Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meal. Then said the Lord of Samaria unto, the, the, the woman, sorry, of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest to drink of me, which am a, a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou, hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. 
But whoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Verse 15, the woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that I, tr- that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus said unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast five husbands, and he has had five husbands. And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In, in that saying, saidest thou truly. The woman said unto him, <clears throat> Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worship in this mountain, and you say, meaning the Jews, you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men are to worship. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you worship, you know not what. You know what ye worship for salvation is of the Jews. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is the spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Verse 27, and upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, what seekest thou, or why talkest thou? with her. And this passage of scripture is where we will turn our attention this morning. Beginning with verse 1 through 3, Jesus is aware of the controversy that is brewing amongst the Jews. For them, it was the baptism of John versus the baptism of Jesus. Who baptized more? They didn't really, the Jews didn't really like John. This is not who baptized more because he's baptizing more than John. They like John. They don't have a love in their heart here for John. He was imprisoned though, and supposedly he was out of the way, and this work of baptizing Saul was still going on, and it was a vexation to their spirit. This matter was not, though, a major importance of any major importance to Jesus. Jesus didn't want to get caught up in this. This is not what the kingdom is about. Who baptized more, I I or John? It didn't matter. Besides, Jesus didn't even baptize himself. His disciples did. However, this was not of a major importance to Jesus, and so he left. He left Judea. John says he was heading for Galilee, and in another version of my Bible, it says he had to go through Samaria. That is verse 4. I discovered, as I studied this thing a little back and forth, because you've got to go over this a little, you know, quite a bit. I discovered that Jesus didn't have to, have to go through Samaria, if you understand what I mean. There was an alternate route. He didn't have to. This was not the only route. Jesus could have gone a different one. He could have gone where the the devout Jew would have gone. Because they did not go through Samaria because they did not want to be contaminated by the Samaritans. He could have taken that. It was a little longer, but he could have taken that route. But he did not. The scripture says in verse 4 that he had to go through Samaria. When I looked at it, I thought he had a mission, and he went direct. This was no ordinary Jew. This Jew disregarded customs and habits. This is the Jew, the Jesus, the creator that we are watching. This is not an ordinary person. This is the savior of the world, and he has a mission. He has a soul to save. I don't know that this is particularly why Jesus went through Samaria. However, I see this as a very important reason why he's going through Samaria. And I studied this back and forth, and there are a few suggestions that maybe um, that Jesus didn't have to go through Samaria to meet this woman. He didn't want to necessarily meet him. She made that choice to go through Samaria. 
whole lot of speculations back and forth. And I don't know which one. In my mind, as I read through the scripture and as I read what Mrs. White has to say, I feel like Jesus is very intentional. He has a purpose. And I don't see him just passing by here and this is a lady just by the way and he wasn't going to meet her. He was going to meet this woman. I need to make three points today. I observe and I watch. One, Jesus had a divine appointment with a sinner. I believe a divine appointment because Jesus prayed before he went on any of his missions or any of his contacts with these human beings. Jesus Jesus prayed. And I believe that this was a divine appointment that he was ready for. Point number two, Jesus is the gospel commission. Jesus is the gospel commission to the world. He is our salvation. And point number three, he commissions. So point number one, the divine appointment. Instead of taking the journey through the desert and avoiding contamination of those Samaritans, he was going to go direct. To quote author Ray Stedman, he says, and I quote, he cut right through that ignorant, narrow-minded prejudice because he had a divine appointment. The Bible says in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. And in this mission, he refused to let barriers erected by sin become a a hindrance. Geography, no problem. He leaves Judea and comes to Jacob's well straight to Samaria. He's going to Galilee. He comes to Jacob's well, and he stops there. He sits at the well in Sychar for a rest. The disciples were charged not to enter into any city of the Samaritans. That is, to preach the gospel or to work miracles. Jesus did not not preach here publicly. Jesus worked no miracles here in Samaria. His eye was on the lost sheep of Israel. So this encounter is but a crumb of the children's bread that falls from the master's stable. And nothing here, however, is happening by accident. This is design. Geography is not a problem. It's going to go to Galilee, but I'm going by way of Samaria. Sex And race, not a problem for Jesus. This is a female who comes to the well for water. She doesn't care to interact with this weary traveler because he's a Jew. So she doesn't do the hospitable thing and offer him a drink, even though she sees him there weary. She doesn't do that. If she wanted to interact with him, she would have offered him a drink. She doesn't do that. But sex... Does it matter to Jesus? It doesn't bother this Jew. The devout Jew won't talk to a woman, and one of my Bibles says it this way, they'd be found dead talking to a Samaritan woman. But this one does. Give me a drink. He says, ooh, he just committed the abominable thing. He talked to a Samaritan, and he talked to a woman. This Jew is talking to a woman in daylight, and he's talking to a Samaritan woman at that. This is an issue. The woman knows it too. She says, you, a Jew, ask me. It's not Jesus so much that tells us it. It's she. It's her reaction that we get it from. She says, how you, how do you, a Jew, come around asking me, a a woman of Samaria, she says, She puts both words in on it. She could have just said a woman, or she could have just said a Samaritan, but she used both words, woman and Samaritan, for a drink. How how does this happen? She is amazed. 
This does not deter our Savior. Mor morality does not deter my Jesus. You understand? All the issues and the hang-ups we have, not a problem for Jesus. They're not a problem for Jesus. It doesn't deter him. She had five husbands, he says. And in my estimation, there is no indication that, these are, that this is a five-time divorcee. I looked at this back and forth. Because then why does he say the one you now have is not your own? And then I looked at it in, in all reality. Who has five husbands? Because you married the first one and that one died and you married the next one and that one died. And five. So this is, uh, you know, I'm coming up with a conclusion here. But these were not all her husbands. And Jesus knows this. She is boring. At least she's boring the last one. Because he says the one you now have is not your own. So she's at least borrowing the last one. Yes. And the point is, he knows this. And he still entertains the conversation with her. So morality does not deter him. Better yet, he pursues the, the, the meeting. Because she wasn't talking to him. He did. He leaves Judea, he stops at Sychar, he sits at Jacob's well, he meets this lone woman. Nobody else is coming to get water from the well but this woman, and he knows that something's up. He knows there's a reason why she's coming in this hot sun to get water. She doesn't want to be seen. Jesus knows, and I'm watching him. I'm watching God. Are you bothered about the issues, the moral issues that people have? You can't talk to them. You can't witness to them because they curse. And your little old ears can't deal with the cursing. Well, they're promiscuous. They drink. They smoke. They lie. They steal. They borrow people's husband. Or they practice homosexuality so you can't talk to them. Jesus does not. This Jew does not have a problem with this human being. He sees the sinner. He knows she is a sinner. But he entertains a conversation with her to save her soul. The scripture says the Savior came to seek and to save that which was lost. All of us. All. I'm going to quote author Billy Bright on the issue of cause and effect. He says, it is now time to recognize with Annie Graham and Alexander Solzhenitsyn and many others that moral collapse is not the issue. It is no more than a symptom of a much deeper problem. Therefore, to allow abortion, homosexual behavior, or any other moral issues to continue to dominate the primary debate is akin to focusing on patching the cracked walls of a building constructed on a crumbling foundation. A discerning person will quickly correct the problem with the foundation. We have a foundation problem. He also says we must begin rebuilding the foundation by making the God of the Bible the eternal issue, the central issue of life in the minds of those around us. If you want them to behave a certain way, look a certain way, speak a certain way, but they do not know God. The foundation problem here is God. It's not fixing the sin. It's getting the sinner to focus on God. God fixes the sin. God changes the person so that they look a little more comely, a little more presentable, a little more like you would like them to appear. God, they've got to connect to the source. At the foundation, we're losing God, losing sight of who he is. God should be our focus. Point number two. Jesus is the gospel commission. As I watched I observed that God is very intentional about the salvation of this woman. Number one, we establish that he could have gone through the desert, the Judean Jericho route, but no, he had to go through Samaria. 
Number two, he could have avoided her and refused to start a conversation with her. He knew she was indecent. She came to the well at an hour that suggested so. Besides, this is a prophet. She says so. Are you a prophet? She knows. Jesus knows that something is the problem here. As a matter of fact, the verse that tells us that she has five husbands says he knows. He knows. Immorality is the issue here. She was not his kind. She is not a, Sam- a Jew. She is a Samaritan. She is a she. This is a woman. He is not supposed to be talking to her. The disciples' reaction says so. Well, what are you doing talking to her? But they don't say it. But they think it. And we are privileged to that information which lets us know Jesus was not supposed to be talking to this woman. Period. She was a sinner. And he was not supposed to be mingling with the sinner. So they thought. So I thought, well, who are these Samaritans that the Jew didn't want to have any dealings with them and they didn't want to have any dealings with, with the Jews? So I went to Ellen G. White. I thought, let's get page 188 and Desire of Ages. And I'll tell you what she says. I have to read this for you very quickly. Okay. Ellen G. White says, The place of worship had been a subject of contention between the Jews and the Samaritans and the Samaritans. Some of the ancestors of the latter, referring to the Samaritans, had once belonged to Israel. But because of their sins, the Lord suffered them to be overcome by an an idolatrous nation. For many generations, they were intermingled with idolaters whose religion gradually contaminated their own. It is true that they held that their idols were only to remind them of the living God, she says. The ruler of the universe, nevertheless, oh, the ruler of the universe, nevertheless, the people were led to reverence their graven images. When the temple of Jerusalem was rebuilt in the days of Ezra, the Samaritans wished to join the Jews in its erection. This privilege was refused to them, and a bitter animosity sprang up between the two peoples. The Samaritans built a rival temple on Mount Gerizim. There they worshipped in, in, in accordance with the Mosaic ritual, though they did not wholly renounce idolatry. But disasters attended them. Their temple was destroyed by their enemies, and they seemed to be under a curse. Yet they still clung to their traditions and their forms of worship. They would not acknowledge the temple at Jerusalem as the house of God, nor admit the religion that the religion of the Jews was superior to their own. So there's an animosity here. So these are who these people are. They are our own brothers and sisters. So Jesus could have avoided the contact because that was the belief in his day. But no, our scripture says he had to go through Samaria. Are you watching God? Are you watching him? Jesus could quit in this conversation at any point, but he doesn't. She is evasive. He offers her salvation. She focuses on the physical, the temporary, the carnal, She's circling around the subject of where to worship, not caring who is worshipped. She's an idolater. She worships idols. She doesn't care who she worships. She's talking about this place that her fathers built and which is better to worship, you know. And Jesus, whom we are watching, is leading her to what is important. Ellen White says, patiently, Jesus permitted her to lead the conversation whether she would. Meanwhile, he watched for an opportunity to again bring the truth home to our heart. Amen? Isn't that what he does with us? We are blessed. Who is worshiping? Where we worship is not quite as important as who is worshiped. Who is worshiping? That's you and me. Where we worship in this building on the Sabbath 
not quite as important as who is worshipped. God. Location is not as important. You must worship God, the Bible tells us, in spirit and in truth. The Zara of Ages again, page 189. Ellen White, I'm quoting her. She says, he, Jesus, desire to lift the thoughts of his hearer, this woman, this is who he's talking to, and then you today, above the matters of form and the ceremony and questions of controversy. The hour cometh, he says to her, and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So I, want to, I just want to draw a few things to your attention here right now. Number one, he meets her at the well. He meets her where she is. He meets you where you are, where no one else is. In your loneliness, in your sadness, in your disgrace, in your carnal way of thinking and behaving, looking after temporary things, he meets you with your facade and your pretentiousness, looking and behaving like you're Christians when you're not. When you are a nobody, and he makes you somebody. All I'm saying is, not calling you names, I'm just saying Jesus meets us in our sin. And he, he's not trying to find the righteous to save, he's trying to get sinners to repentance. So obviously, they're messed up. It's almost like you expect sinners to have it all together. No, Jesus puts it together. A second point, he doesn't discriminate. He confidently, and I say confidently, delivers the gospel message of his saving grace to a woman, a Samaritan woman, an adulterer, and an idolater. Go figure. We have hang-ups. Jesus does not. No reserve. He would deliver his message to the children if they could understand it and they would deliver it. He doesn't care. He came to save, to seek and to save that which was lost, which is all of us, all. Number three, he's patient with her. He doesn't insult. He doesn't degrade. He doesn't embarrass. He, says, he states the facts. He says, five husbands. Number six is still not yours. He says, salvation is of the Jews. We know who we worship. You Samaritans do not know who you worship. He states the facts. The woman's not offended. She's amazed that he's saying all these things to her. She doesn't feel threatened because he's talking in this way to her. He doesn't make her feel unimportant. He points out the things that she needs to know, and this helps her to understand who he is. This is no ordinary person that you're encountering here today. So already in her mind, I suggest to you, she has questions. This man is making me feel a little queasy. He's not ordinary. She says it in her own words. She says, are you a prophet or something? She's thinking it already in her mind. And the final point on this section. He doesn't perform any miracles here. We said that before. By the way, he doesn't always perform miracles. For my Sabbath school class, we talked about this a few weeks ago. He determines its necessity, and that's not based on how badly you want one. He determines how necessary that is. 
So you may sit here in church for many years and not see one. They're just doing it to please you. It's not about you. The faster we realize this, the better. So your family members will get sick and you lose them. He's saving them. Not necessarily bringing them back to life. And I can attest to that now. Okay? So why don't we all share it? He's not going to do this the way you want it done. He tells her her secrets. That's all. This is what brings her mind to understand who he is. He tells her her secret, and that gets her attention. No one is healed. No dead is raised. No one sees. No deaf hears. And he did all of this for the Jewish nation, and they couldn't get it. But the Samaritans... Watch and see how they tune in. I'm saying Jesus is looking. I'm watching Jesus and I'm looking at how, you know, how deliberate he is to save these people. And I'm glad because this makes me remember this is how he looks at me. He looks down there and he doesn't matter that I am messed up and miserable, complaining and whining. He doesn't care. You are, but he doesn't care. He's not put off. He's still working on me. And that makes me happy. That makes me happy. He says to her simply, I, when he's already laid the foundation, laid the stage, he says, I that speak unto thee, I'm he. That's it. Word. That's the word right there. This is page 190. Let's see what Ellen White says. I like this, so I've got to share it. Ellen White says, this woman was in an appreciative state of mind. She was ready to receive the noblest revelation, for she was interested in the scriptures. What I found out was that the, the Samaritans accepted the, 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 the five um, books of Moses and did not care about the rest of it, the, the books of Moses. That's what they, they, they accepted. But look at this. And Jesus, in all of his mercy, made her saw this little hope of salvation in the last of those five books, Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15. It says, Ellen White says, She had studied the Old Testament promise, and the verse is, The Lord thy God will raise unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken. She longed, Ellen White says, to understand this prophecy. Oh, five books, that's all. And in those five books, God, in his mercy, avails for her the promise of that Savior. She longed to understand this prophecy. Light was already flashing in her mind. The water of light, the spiritual life, which Christ, Christ gives to her thirsty soul, had begun to spring, in, spring up in her heart. The spirit of the Lord was working with her, with this adulteress. Amen. I love it. God's word is, is so sweet. If we watch at him long enough, if we stare, if we gaze on him long enough, we will shed the things in our lives that are unlike him and will become more like him with each passing day. I'm at my third point. He commissions. He just needs a willing vessel. Woman, man, boy, girl, does not matter to my Jesus. This is what I like. Jesus uses whatever available means to spread the beautiful message. He doesn't have the cultural hang-ups we have. He doesn't care who you are. He just commissioned, brothers and sisters, the first woman evangelist. And I love it. He did. A Samaritan, a woman. We don't even know her name for crying out loud. We refer to her as the woman at the well. We say the Samaritan woman. Who cares who she is? Nobody does. We don't even know. That's not the important thing. This is what we know of her. We know that she's nameless. At least in this story, we don't get a name. We know that she's a woman. We know that she's a Samaritan woman. 
We know that she's an adulteress. We know that she's an idolater. We know all the bad things about her. But we also know this. She announced to the whole village that she would like them to come and check out this guy. It may be the Christ. It may be the Christ. Mission accomplished. Effective witness. We don't need her name because this is not about her. It's Jesus that we're watching. It's about Jesus. So her name is unimportant, just like her past behavior is unimportant. What you were is not important to Jesus. Who you are is important to him. It changes your life and makes you a new creature. He takes that same adulteress and he, he tells her the message of salvation as she goes and preach. Amen. Amen. Jesus said, go call your husband that he may reveal to her her sin. That, that Jesus, right? That Jesus would, that's why he told her that. Go call your husband. He wanted to bring to her attention her sin. He sees five plus one. You know she's not foolish. She understands. She understands and show, and, and she's as slow as the disciples are. She is thinking about temporary things, just like the disciples were thinking about temporary things. They know better than each other. They're all thinking. When they came back, they said, well, he said, Jesus said he wasn't hungry. And they said, well, who gave him to eat? Really? He's not talking about that. He's not talking about, about physical food. Jesus is talking about spiritual things right now. This woman leaves the water pot and she ran. And I am watching God. And I see love. I see care. I see patience. I see compassion. I see power. I see that there is power. Tasha Cobb sings. In the name of Jesus, he breaks every chain. Breaks the chains of sin. If you can't do repetition, you're not going to be able with this song. But it tells me what I need to know. He breaks every chain. The chains of sin. She sings, there's an army rising up to break every chain. I pray that God will raise us up an army in here who will get excited about the things he's told us. And go out to share it, to extend it to the world around us. He commissioned this Samaritan woman, this idol worshiper. He frees her of her sin. And he allows her to go share the message of salvation. I am watching God, my brothers and sisters. I'm staring at his face. I am amazed at how much I see now when I look at him. He softens you. He softens you, softens your blow of all the problems that come your way. And you think you had it so hard, but Jesus is actually there working behind the scenes to make it just a little bit easy for you. He says, regardless of what you have done, just stop it. Five, six husbands, stop it, he says. And now, now you're commissioned to go tell the world Jesus saves I want to share a very quick testimony with you. Jesus is getting his world ready for his soon coming. Sometimes we feel very anxious about what are we doing here. I felt this feeling before, like what are we doing? Let's get up and do something. These days I don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. That is not your worry. God has given you the message to go and share Share it to the best of your ability. Don't be concerned. Everybody else is going gonna to wear you down. So this week, I had a testimony, uh, an encounter, and I have to share this with you. There's a gentleman at my job. Now let's say I'm going to call him <laughs> and see how well I remember this name. I'm going to call him Daniel. That sounds easy enough. Daniel is a, is, is a bulky-looking guy. He's a male nurse. He, he wears his hair in a ponytail. Um, he has two earrings in his ear. He looks more like a biker kind of a person. I've never asked. We, we speak quite well enough as we, we, you know, we work together. 
I've never asked if he's a biker, but he has that kind of a look. <laughs> Just for those of us who look and guess what people are. In my mind, quietly, softly, I don't say anything. But he has, a, not that anything is wrong with that. That's the picture I formed, okay? <coughs> and so, Daniel, did I say Daniel? <laughs> Daniel, um, when I was leaving work, and, and I work Sunday, Monday, I was leaving work um, Sunday night. He was coming in on the night shift, and I said, well, you all have a good night. And he said, um, well, what are you going to do? I said what I was going to do, and he said, well, why don't you try a, a, a good book? And, and I said, well, what book are you thinking about? And he says, have you tried The Desire of Ages? I was going out with my jacket on, bag on my, on my shoulders. I turned back. I said, did you say the desire of ages? Because now I'm getting excited, okay? He said, yes. I said, what do you know about the desire of ages? He said, I read the book. He says, it's a good read. And he says, and right, by the way, I think the author is right on. I said, you're serious? I said, what do you know? He says, I asked, what do you know again about, about this author? He says, Ellen G. White, he says. He said, I read her. I have more books. I have, uh, I don't know which ones he counted. I couldn't quite figure. He told me about two volumes, and I started thinking maybe the testimonies, and I wasn't sure where he was going. With. He couldn't remember which ones they were. And I said to him, have you read The Great Controversy? He's reading already. I'm saying that to say, you know, Jesus is working this thing out. We pray for an opportunity. He'll bring us an opportunity. That's the way I look at it. I'm not dying about it anymore. I'm going to do the best I can. I'm looking. I'm keeping an eye open for an opportunity to share. And he says, the great controversy? No, I don't know. I don't know about that one. I said, I will bring you the great controversy. I kid you not. I came home. I searched. I found me one paper. I'm back because I didn't want to give my hard cover. <laughs> but um, I figured if I couldn't find a paper, then we're going with the hard cover because you're getting this book tonight, tomorrow morning. <laughs> and so I tried really hard. I put it on the counter. I took it everywhere when I was going in the morning until I was going through the door. The last thing, the great controversy. We can't forget it. We get back to work and we give him the great controversy. I'm saying this to say there are other people at my job who I have focused on. They, they're more inclined to religious things. You know, they ask me questions. There's a young lady. She asks me all the time. She says, well, how was church? She's interested in what's going on in the Middle East and the Jewish people and so on. I don't always know to answer, but she has this interest, so I'm trying to find out so I can talk. You know, and she says, she says, she asked me, how well, how was church? Every Sunday morning we work. How was church? And I'd let her know how church was. So that's who I'm keeping an eye out on. You understand? I'm not looking at Daniel, right? <laughs> I'm not looking at him. I'm looking at her over done there. Well, when I was done with, with him, I went back to work on, 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 um, on Thursday, and she said to me, she came looking for me again. She always makes a little time to find me. And she's asking me about these things if I heard what's going on. And to make a very long story short, I said to her, you know what? I was talking to Daniel the other day, and I just offered him the great controversy. I said, have you read the great controversy? And she said to me, well, no. Which book is that? And I said, well, I've got to tell you about the great controversy. But you know what? Why don't I try to find a copy at my church and bring it for you so you can read? Because I'm sure I don't have another paper back at home. So you can read. But before I was ready to leave to come home, she was back over. She said, I pulled it up on the phone. I found it. Go read. And then we'll talk. Amen. I'm like, you know, we look for these opportunities. We just have to keep them open. The Lord will do his work. And you know what? He's very intentional about the souls he has to save. He doesn't go around the Jericho route. He goes smack through Samaria, wherever they are, and he finds them. He sits there and waits until they come by for their little water. And he's waiting to minister to those souls. And you and I have a beautiful privilege to be a part of that ministry. This morning, glory to God for who he is and for how much he cares, not just for us, but all of those that are out there. God bless you.